Welcome to the first 2022 Origin Trail Community Tech Call. I'm really excited to see all of you here, guys. This is, uh, this is great. 41, okay. I guess we should wait for a few more people then. 44, nice. All right. So, oh, uh, I need to see who all is here. Who do I know? Wow, okay, quite a few people. Shout outs. Shout outs are, are totally in place. IOTB, hello, Calvin, Cosme. Hello, Trace Labs developers. Hello, everybody. All right. There's too many of you to shout out. Uh, so I'll stop here. Uh, awesome. So I guess it's the right time to get started. Hey, hey, hey. There's a very active chat. So yes, uh, feel free to be active in the chat. Today, we're going to be doing quite a few uh, demonstrations. We, we actually wanted to fit even more things into the call. We didn't manage to, uh, but that's going to be great because we're going to be, be doing another one soon. Um, so um, yeah, let's get started. I'll quickly share my screen. Just let's see if that works. So just a little bit of basic hygiene for the beginning. Uh, it will be great if uh, everybody is muted while not speaking. That's one of the things that I guess is kind of a, becoming the new normal now, but just making sure that everybody is following that, um, let's say etiquette. So we're, um, so we're actually having a smooth call. And uh, yes, uh, other than that, just a bit of intro for today. We're going to be showing uh, three, actually three different presentations, and then we're going to have a Q and A, uh, really an open discussion at the end. We'll try to be brief and not boring with presentations. We don't like boring presentations either, so I'm sure you don't. Uh, so we'll try to to make it concise. Of course, if you have a question, two ways you can post it. One way you can go into chat. There's actually quite a few developers from the Trace Labs team on the call that can maybe immediately answer your question. Uh, if not, we'll keep it for the QA later. So it would be good if we don't break the flow of the presenters, but immediately after every presentation, we'll have a very short, uh, short uh, let's say Q&A. We, we can try with that. Let's see how it works. But in the end, we'll have an open discussion slot so everybody can jump in with their thoughts or generally ideas. Um, so without further ado, um, I will kick this off and then um, just let me know if you guys can see my screen. I need somebody, I need one confirmation for this. Yeah, it's perfect. Awesome, confirmation received. So like I said, welcome to the first technical community call for this year. Uh, we're happy to have you all. We're gonna have them uh, probably every couple of weeks two or four, depending on, on the, well, the schedules, but you can expect a lot of these calls to happen more often. Uh, obviously, feedback is very much appreciated. So anything you, you see that we can improve, um, how you can participate, feel free to, to shoot suggestions our way. So um, what we're gonna be talking about today is a couple of things. We're gonna go through an intro into the DKG version six. So this is a version six theme technical call. We're going to be speaking about V6 in an introductory sense. Then we're going to have an introductory tutorial. Our own Nicola, or NZT, as you might know him from Discord, he is going to give us a, a quick, very uh, lightweight intro. At least we hope it's very lightweight. Then we're going to see actually how the DKG is currently in action in uh, the FSM data marketplace uh, application. So. Um, I will also be showing this one um, today. And then finally, we're going to very quickly touch upon the bounty program that we have launched yesterday. Finally, uh, as I said, finishing with a discussion and Q&A. So quite a few things to do. We tried to uh, limit ourselves for the first couple of sessions. So 
Um, we might be a little faster than than um, than usually you see at presentations, but uh, I guess that's how how we roll in Web three today. So we need to be savvy of time and and um, and energy of everybody. So we'll try to fit everything in an hour. Uh, let's see how well it goes. All right. So I hear a little bit of echo from somebody um, somebody who was who probably should mute themselves, uh, but um, I'm good to go. So. Let's get started. So the first one is the intro to DKG v6, or what that means, uh, and what we will be building or biddling together over the course of the next uh, period. Uh, we are currently in the launch phase of Origin 12 version 6. Uh, so there's quite a few things that have already been built. There's things that are still being added on top, uh, polished, tested, broken. So uh, you're all invited to join, <clears throat> join in this effort. And for that, actually, I said there's this bounty program we launched. If you are not aware of it, you will be aware after this call. So, okay, what is the, what is the whole point of this decentralized launch graph? Really quickly, the point is to organize humanity's most important assets, making them discoverable, verifiable, and valuable. And we'll explain in very fine detail today what this means. I just want you to understand what is the whole, the whole point. Some people have a position um, uh, with uh, obvious uh, reasons, uh, valid reasons. Origin Trail is kind of a supply chain tool or some sort of traceability tool. Uh, well, actually, it is much more than that. It's, it is more of a foundational technology on top of which you can build traceability tools. Uh, but not just that. Actually, much, much more than that. And we'll see that today. Uh, but very briefly, it's what, what, my, what you need to take away from here is that we're discussing about various types of assets, and those types of assets are both physical and digital. And we're taking the ones from the physical world into the digital realm, really going from data to assets. So no longer just speaking about data in terms of it being raw or structured, uh, but also and just something that, that is uh, uh, like a, a material rather uh, out of this material, we create new things, new assets. And then finally, we move from Web2 data silos to the semantic Web3. And you might have not uh, heard this term semantic Web3 that much before. Well, that's because not many uh, other projects in the Web3 are actually approaching the Web3 from the angle of semantics. And um, I'll explain why Origin Trail is. So Origin Trail is really the world's first decentralized knowledge graph. What that means is it's a multi-blockchain decentralized knowledge graph. It communicates with uh, several blockchains. It is decentralized in infrastructure. And it's this cool technology called knowledge graphs, which I'll explain briefly. Essentially, it's a decentralized semantic layer that synergizes knowledge graphs and blockchains. And right now, there's a permissionless network, the mainnet of Origin Trail, running uh, with support of over 2,000 nodes ran by the Origin Trail community, some of you on this call. Uh, shout out to all of you. And uh, it really provides this data persistence and network effect incentivization for this decentralized knowledge graph to grow. So the key thing here is that it's um, it's permissionless. And if you look, if you try to position it in your head, it's somewhere, let's say, in between your Web3 applications and blockchains um, as as a, a sort of a middleware in a, in a way. It's, it's not used for the same things that blockchains are used for. And what it's used for, we will explain today. Um, but briefly, how do we observe blockchains? How do we observe knowledge graphs? So blockchains we see as trust networks. That basically is a tamper-proof shared ledger. I think pretty much everybody on the call has at least heard of blockchains, but you guys know that this uh, immutability property that, that, that can be achieved through this uh, concept of consensus. And what it really comes down to is tamper-proof shared ledger. Uh, what it's great for is decentralized identity, tokenization of assets such as NFTs. I'm sure everybody's heard of that so far. Decentralized finance as well, one of the things that's been growing like crazy. Uh, but really, these cases have become uh, something common because of this uh, property of trust. While knowledge graphs are actually semantic networks. So by um, Semantic, what we mean is actually moving from, like I said, raw data or strings towards things. And this is actually what Google coined as a term, things not strings is how they explain in shortest what their knowledge graph is. So it's really an interconnected set of entities in a knowledge graph. And 
guess what? All of these big Web2 companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, Uber, Twitter, NASA, uh, you name it, they all use knowledge graphs uh, because exactly because they're semantic networks, because then they're able to generate a lot of value out of the data that they, they aggregate and connect into this, these large, humongous knowledge graphs. Um, for example, when you do a Google search uh, and, and you see uh, next to your search results, you see a box, like for example, if you look for search for Albert Einstein and on the right side of your screen, you will see basically his picture pop up, some information on him like date of birth, that he was a scientist, perhaps I'm sort of winging it here, but you'll most likely get something like that. That is because Google understands that um, you're looking for a person named Albert Einstein, that that's actually a person. It's not just a, some tabular data or some JSON file or some random uh, semi-structured thing. Google actually understands it's a person and it's connected with other people and with other universities, for example, where Einstein studied and so on. To mute himself, Siddhar Ganguri, please. Uh, I'm sorry to have to call you out like this. <laughs> and please, everybody else, if you guys can uh, mute while you're not talking, that would be awesome. Because it creates noise uh, for, for the rest. All right. So uh, that was a brief intro. But why do we build this? Well, we build this to drive network effects, really. So we believe information is inherently valuable. And that the centralized knowledge graph actually unlocks the Metcalf's law of network effects for humanity's most important assets by making them discoverable, verifiable, and valuable, as we mentioned. And basically, this Metcalf's law of network effects, if you haven't heard before, is, is this on the right. It says that the value of a network is proportional to the square of the number of participants in the network. So take your cell phone network. If only two people had cell phones in the world, the value of this network would be very small because it will be proportional to two squared, which is four, which means only two people can speak to each other. It's valuable, but not as valuable as, as let's say, if 50 people can speak to each other, then you get a 50 squared uh, value um, uh, proportionate actually to 50 squared. Now, it, the more you scale this, obviously, if you're uh, familiar with, with uh, exponential functions, the more this value grows. And this is actually very true for knowledge graphs. Um, by the way, Bob Metcalf is one of our advisors. So we're working with him on applying this particular theory to knowledge graphs. He's not the guy in the bottom left corner that you see. That, that is actually Robert Noyce, co-founder of Intel, uh, with a very nice quote that I like to point out every now and then, probably boring some people that have seen it many times. <laughs> he says that knowledge is power and that knowledge shared is power multiplied. So this is what, what really caters to this concept of growth of value, because the more things we get to connect in the decentralized knowledge graph, the more valuable it will be and the more, uh, more uh, different things we are able to do with that. So um, some of the companies that are using Origin Trail uh, decentralized knowledge graph today are the British Standards Institution. They use it for assurance, compliance, and, and every other things as well. Swiss Railway Company for supply chain transparency, uh, American retailers such as Walmart, Target, uh, all of the ones in uh, the Trusted Factory program by Scan Association. There's a, a bunch of other use cases, uh, a pharmaceutical use case just recently deployed. And I'm speaking of production use cases here. These are not some POCs or something that's you know new. We're speaking of uh, the, the projects that are running for years already. Um, anyhow, the, the point here is not to do marketing. The point is just to explain that uh, this is already news and uh, we're actually working on version six. So, um, okay, a couple of other uh, points of organizations that support Origin Trail, such as World Economic Forum, Oracle, like I said, BSI and Walmart through different awards, um, as, as you might have seen already. So, what can you do with Origin Trail? Well, basically, you can build with semantic high quality verifiable data. You can publish verifiable claims from any system, like a traditional system or an existing blockchain system or any new system, integrate data across Web3 seamlessly, build privacy-first metaverse-ready dApps, um, discover and crowdsource high-quality data sets. We'll speak about that 
in, in particularly on the FSM uh, case. And then obviously uh, tokenize your dynamic assets. Dynamic meaning that they're, the data associated with these assets can easily grow unconstrained by the constraints of blockchain. So how does this look like architecturally? So conceptually, you might have seen this on the website. Basically on the top, we have web three applications and we have a service layer on top of these services. We have various different things, uh, but basically consider all of the things that uh, you might be creating on top of the graph, fitting in one of these two layers. Either it will be an application or it will even go into the service layer. There's a plugin architecture that is uh, under development for version six actually, that will, be, that will enable building additional services and plugins on top. Then we have this data layer, which is really the knowledge graph. Um, and then a network layer, which is actually hosting the knowledge graph for the, all of the nodes in the decentralized knowledge graph. And finally, there's a consensus layer, which is actually a, uh, a set of blockchains the knowledge graph can use for certain operations. And um, one key thing to, to also note here is that actually these three bottom layers are, are the core layers of the decentralized knowledge graph. They actually uh, kind of look a little bit more like this. So the graph layer, the idea here is that you're able to utilize different type of graph databases, triple stores. Um, for the network layer, obviously we, we utilize uh, the proven lib P2P, but also the Cadence library. Uh, Cadence is a, a, a both of them implementations of Kademia DHT. And then in the consensus layer, actually there's, there's more of them. There's Akala and others coming up. But the point there being is that you have a choice. You have a set of options that uh, as an implementation uh, team, for example, you can choose. So if you want to run an origin trail node, you might want to say, okay, I'm going to use Neo4j or Blaze Graph because that fits my use case. Or I'm going to use Polygon blockchain because I don't know, I'm a big fan of Polygon or Akala because I'm building something in Substrate uh, or origin trail parachain in the future. So the point here is to be neutral. That's one of the principles of origin trail. Um, ecosystem in general, but generally development. We don't want to say you guys should use this chain or you guys need to use this particular database. Ideally, you choose it on your own. And we create interfaces that, that this, um, this actually can, um, can support um, uh, cases like that. So what is the general functionality? Well, if we look at uh, the functionalities, we can split them in sort of two sets of protocols. We have indexing and querying protocols, and then we have data exchange protocols, which are here at the bottom. And then we can uh, identify in basic terms that we have some data provider and some data consumer, obviously, of this system. Data provider would publish something to the decentralized knowledge graph, while a data consumer would query that. Mm, echo, echo, echo. That was very much echoing. Uh, anyhow, uh, once the data providers publish things to the decentralized knowledge graph and the decentralized knowledge graph persists them, not persists them, this is a typo, um, actually persists them in a immutable way. So there's um, these, these, this data that gets published, all of this whole graph is associated with a set of fingerprints that are published on the blockchains, um, which can then be used for various uh, verifiability purposes, including when the data consumer queries the, the decentralized knowledge graph to some interface. This interface can either be a client, one of those we'll see today, a client library or a, a light node, which is uh, basically integrated into the network. Um, currently light nodes are under development, by the way. So right now, this is kind of the thing. If somebody publishes data, others, others query it, there's various different ways to query it. But essentially querying means also discovering something in the public knowledge graph. Now, naturally not all data gets to be public. For example, if you want to sell some data, you won't put it up publicly, right? Because then there is no point in selling it. Um, then you go to the second layer, the data exchange protocols. So you have discovered something on the network, data on some asset or data on some system. And then you're able to query this particular system or this private knowledge graph through uh, a specific data exchange protocol. And the idea here is to support multiple data exchange protocols, as well as indexing and querying protocols. So we so uh, protocols extendable over time. And we'll show you today, basically the whole flow. We'll so show you how we uh, publish 
a simple data set on the on the knowledge graph, how you can query it, and even uh, how data exchange protocols work. Very briefly, this functionality overview means that we can index and provision assets in the DKG. We can connect them in graphs. Uh, we can publish linked verifiable assertions. These are just some examples. Query network for, for assets. So for example, for a specific NFT, you can resolve by a did or a UAL. We'll talk more about that when the time comes. Search by keywords, run fully fledged queries, uh, get obviously integrity proofs, as we mentioned, because we're in Web3 without being able to verify something, a means we're kind of, well, not really in Web3, right? We need, we're, we're then in the Web2 domain. So the whole point of this graph is that we all build it together by publishing data to it, uh, data on various assets or even provisioning the assets in the graph. And then whoever queries it has uh, mechanisms to verify the integrity. And that means verify immutability, but also verify the issuer. So if you're reading something, you know exactly who it comes from and is, is it really been published in that form. Uh, is it a truth machine though? Um, well, not necessarily. So there's no algorithm in the world that, <laughs> well, you can put some data in it and it spits out, this is true or false, except like maybe mathematical equations for, for other things, this doesn't work. So uh, actually this is something what, uh, which um, means that all of the data published on the decentralized knowledge graph are actually assertions. Somebody said something about something. Uh, maybe an application made an assertion of some on some NFT. Maybe uh, a company claimed that it issued a certificate to me because I passed some training course. That's that's the whole point. And then somebody's able to verify that indeed this company did that, and indeed it did it in this form. Some very important primitives here. All right, and then obviously finally subscribing for updates on assets. I forgot that I had another bullet here. Some resources that are available to learn more. You can basically, this is all open source. You can take the, the DKG node and tool stack, including the client uh, that we'll show today. There's test nets, mainnet, obviously, documentation, tutorials. We'll have these tech community calls probably every four weeks uh, in this year, but most likely even uh, more frequently during the stages of the V6 launch. So stay tuned for that. And obviously we have a Discord channel where we have quite a, a vibrant discussion going on. And um, with that, I'm gonna finish this intro and um, thank you for the attention. Uh, again, remember we're using this to take us from web two to semantic web three, and we're going to work on it together. So um, I hope this, this was uh, informative on a high level. Now we're going deeper and we're having the first uh, DKG version 6 101 tutorial by none other than NZT, Nicola, uh, who is going to take over screen sharing and basically show you each of these uh, operations on the version 6 of the decentralized knowledge graph, um, um, which you can basically test and perform on your own. Um, it might It's the first time we're doing this, so it might be that... Um, you know, some things are not super clear. We would really appreciate your feedback later. And also be mindful that this uh, API is still not 100% uh, done. So there's things that will be updated, uh, but it is really for illustration purposes and like most, the, the, the most, uh, let's say, fundamental things will definitely not change. So uh, thanks, Nicola. Go ahead and take it away. I'll mute myself and stop screen sharing. Thanks, Branimir. Okay, so hi everyone. As you probably already know, my name is Nicola, one of the Origin Trail Call develop developers, and I have been probably with, interacted with some of you on the Discord in the last month and so. And our today topic is to get started with the DKG. The main idea is to just help you with the introduction to see where to start, where to look for things, and how to perform some important how to important operations. Let's say so. So uh, the first thing from where we want to start is always the documentation. And here in the documentation, at the left side at the end, we have the the section for the all the V6 stuff. And as probably most of you have already done, you have set up the notes and here is the instructions that will be 
also updated and made more clear, but uh, we, today we'll be focused on the using of DKG and the starting point for that will be the DKG V6 API tab. Here you can see that we have prepared some V6 uh, API documentation swagger, but also it will be very useful to start uh, learning about DKG by using this Postman collection that we have. Like this is, you can download it from this link here and import it into your Postman, it will look like this. So to add a little bit more context, right now we are having a small network running in the uh, local environments for nodes that are connected and that are waiting for our request to come. So the first and the basic one is the info route that we want to check just that everything is working well. But to get do the real thing, we need to start with the publishing. So to have anything in the in the or decentralized knowledge graph, we need to add some assets to it. Assets are those unique data and the unique uh, entities. In this case, we have or special tracy called dev tracy nft and for this tracy we will be publishing an assertion assertion is a gra specialized graph data set that will be associated with this one asset so one asset ha can have multiple uh, assertions the first one will be just the let's say introductory asset for the this nft and later we can publish some new assertion to let's say update information about our asset that tracy and to say that it it has some new owner and similar thing so by entering the the required part that is file and the asset name keywords we can associate some special keywords to make it make it more easy discoverable but it's also an optional and visibility is the thing that brana mentioned if you want to Publish in the private graph or make it public for everyone to use. We will make it public for everyone. So we'll perform here publish and use here the handler ID, go to the publish result route, try to fetch to see. So we here see the publishing is pending. And if you jump up here to the node logs, we can see he, it's been doing some operations. So just quick to go over. After it received publish, it will some to perform some expanding of metadata and preparing stuff, and then it will search for the nodes on the network. So uh, uh, DKG node will look using indexing protocol and incentivization, incentivization. What is the best nodes chosen for the to store this data, and if they want to choose the data. So right now, using the indexing protocol, we look at XOR distance and search, uh, choose some of them and ask them to store our data. So we can here see that our all nodes and network have received the data. So if you check again the publishing, we can see that it's finished and we can proceed to see how we can query this data, how we can get to see it if it's on the network and what we know about it. So the first thing we can use the ID provided from the publisher and to try to resolve. Resolve is the simplest query that will try to fetch us the data that we have, the data that we have published or the assertion to be more precise. So if we fetch this assertion, we can see here all the information about the data set and we can see that this is some special trace example for a community call and some topics, uh, some ID and different to not go into details too much about this. We can also perform search, search on entities level and search on the assertion level. So let us search for this assertion that we have published right now. And also in this same situation, uh, our node will try to contact all the possible nodes that have the assertion that we published earlier. So let us see and here and we take a look at the results we can see that we have three nodes that are contacted us and give us back the information we can see all the important thing and by using id we can again resolve back the data to see 
one also important feature of our VKG is that it can accept Sparkle queries. And here I have some example Sparkle query performed that will be executed on, on or not. Sorry, just first to send it. Here maybe we can see also that the node is doing some measuring, like seeing how much operation I've finished measuring of the search command. So it's constantly looking at its performances so we can make it better and more powerful in the future. So yeah, I already performed the query earlier. So here is the result and the results in the format of triples, subject, predicate, and object over here. And also uh, performing queries like when you saw here in the supercharger app with some of examples, we can also do it directly in the Sparkle query. So every node has this GraphDB interface where you can perform directly on the database the queries and see the results if, but that's almost, that's the same operation as the querying here, in the node. So uh, this one was the step-by-step -step using Postman, but also one and recommended way is to use the DKG client. So it's a wrapper around all the API calls and we can start it right now. So it will connect to our node by initializing and giving it the options of the host name and everything. It then will just fetch to see if it's alive. Right now, local node is not have not enabled to monitor an auto update because it's in development environment, and we will let it do publishing of some example data set. Okay, we can see here that the same things will happen. So while is the node doing the publishing? Yeah, we have here published the data. So everything is the same, very, very small. You just give options and call the, call the operation that you want. So after publishing, we can do some resolving. We here resolve some data set about uh, John von Neumann. Also, we can continue to the next operation. This is searching. So here we have, um, uh, the high level of the logs that can be disabled so you don't need to see what's exactly happening. So here for the term that we search is this executive anvil and we can see that four nodes is, are storing information about this. And okay, next operation is the searching over entities. We can do that also. Not Maybe sure. I can stop you there for a second, yeah. just to give a little more context and an sure. additional piece of information. So what, what does this searching look like? Well, basically, it looks exactly the same as searching in the Google Knowledge Graph. And uh, we made sure that the API itself is even completely returning the same result. It's in interoperable. So uh, when Nicola says searching, you're able to search for entities or assets in the graph. Uh, just like I mentioned in the beginning, you, you can search Albert Einstein in Google and it will return a person, uh, plus all of the results for that, um, let's say, websites that somehow relate to Albert Einstein. Um, and in this case, you can also see both. So you can see all assertions, all the data sets that people have published, or more, more precisely assertions, on the, let's say, Albert Einstein. And just like in Google, there's some sort of search ranking, right? Not um, not everything should be at the top. Uh, well, the most relevant results should be at the top. And we'll talk about this relevance at some other point. But apart from these results that are assertions, you also get uh, entities and the, you get the actual object, the, the, the result. Like for example, we've seen in the NFT before, uh, that was actually the object. You've seen a, a visualization of a tracy in this supercharger interface, maybe you've seen it before as well. Uh, well, basically that is a demonstration of how you can see a profile of such an, uh, an asset or object in, in the graph, not just, uh, let's say a bunch of data or a list of, of results as in Google. So there's various types of searches. You can search for entities, for assertions, potentially we will introduce some more flexible uh, ways in, in the core API, uh, but uh, anything can really be implemented on this query uh, uh, call because really the query call enables you to do any type of Sparkle query 
uh, that, that you, you can think of. And for those of you who might have not heard of Sparkle before, think of it as SQL, SQL, whatever you call it, uh, where you live. Um, it's, it's literally the same thing, but for graphs. So you can write select uh, name dot something dot whatever from this, uh, from the DKG where, I don't know, contract equals that or blockchain equals polygon. So um, that is, this is the semantic uh, property that we get from using the decentralized knowledge graph, which is something that the blockchains don't have. You cannot go in and say, write a select query on a blockchain, right? You can, you can do, uh, you can resolve, you can get something at an address, you can find a block, but kind of basically you're very limited to that. You can query a smart contract uh, by its getter functions, but you cannot write an arbitrary query. So this is what the, the, the DKG lets you do. And one of the types of the queries is the search. Anyhow, sorry uh, for the, the side uh, note, Nicola, I'll let you take over. Uh, continue, no. sorry. Thank you, Brian. I think it is important to make some point and to add more information to it. So here is also another example of the query performed by the DKG client. Also just given the plain query directly into the method, we will get the result in the format of subject, predicate and object. And uh, the next part that is additional feature that provides us the, the DKG client is to do the validations. So here we can choose some triplets that we want to ch check if they are valid and we will do call the validation option all over them. And in that case, we will see that the, no, the, the client will get proofs for them, then resolve to get the data sets and then perform a full validation for that data that we have. So we have the valid result for the bot triple that's fine. And that's all for the usage of the DKG client. So uh, I, I try to be short, not to go too much into details. There is a lot of new things here for you, but uh, the next call probably will be uh, trying to, to show you more internal stuff, how it's working, how you can jump into code, into trying to modify it and to create some new things into DKG and also onto DKG. I hope this just inspired you for more of the part of working on the DKG. All right. Um, perhaps it's a good moment to open up for a few questions if there are any, because this was highly technical. So if we wait for the end, probably people will forget <laughs> what they want to ask for. So anybody on the call, questions, feedback, anything? going once. Okay, going twice. Oh, there's a question. It says, when data is published, is it persisted to all nodes on the network? Very good question. Actually, no, it's not persistent on all the nodes on the network. It's actually persisted on a set of nodes on the network. And, um, that set is actually determined by this incentivization protocol that we mentioned. And essentially the indexing protocol involves incentivization and replication protocols. So uh, the reason why Origin Trail is able to scale better in data operations compared to blockchains is that it actually um, hosts the data outside of the blockchain as well as doesn't host it on every node. When you have a blockchain, every node hosts the whole blockchain and every node uh, performs the same operations, right? So uh, there's obviously high cost when you put something on a chain. So if you don't, let's say a couple of savings you can do is first of all, they all of them keep all of the data for all of eternity, right? Um, at least theoretically. So you can shorten the time. That's one of the things you can kind of save on. Save on. And the other one is you can lower the, the amount of replication because you might not necessarily need tens of thousands of machines to host something. And the clever uh, incentivization and indexing protocol for DKG actually places the, the, the data in the right place in the network, still sufficiently replicated over hundreds of nodes. Um, and, and these nodes actually getting rewards. 
but not actually hosting everywhere. And that actually helps with indexing because later it helps with searching, with querying, that you're able to query the right partition in the network, as we, as we call it. It's a, it's kind of a, like a shard in terms of blockchain, but it's not uh, not necessarily the same thing if you're considering blockchains. It's, it's a different type of a structure. So it's persisted on on a set of nodes called really a partition partition, and this partition is is incentivized to hold the data for a certain amount of time. The question about GDPR compliance is a really good one. It actually uh, involves um, providing tools how to be GDPR compliant while use, using this. It's a big issue with blockchain because if you store something on the chain like data on the chain and God forbid you put something of privacy, um, um, uh, sensitive in terms of privacy, you're out of luck. But the idea here is that you're able to utilize uh, what Nicola already mentioned, private graphs. So you're able to set visibility on some data and, and keep it privately. So whatever is hosted in the public knowledge graph obviously is hosted publicly, but you're able to link the same public knowledge graph with the private graphs that remain within the context, uh, context of your node. And that means if I go back here to explain with a little more graphics. So if you were to index something publicly in the DKG and ref have that refer or point to a private asset or private set of data that involves something GDPR relevant, then this data exchange protocol can be used in between direct parties that want to exchange this if they want to exchange uh, on this uh, access control level. And this is where the knowledge markets like knowledge tokens come into, into play. Um, but it's a bit of a longer topic. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more in the next presentation. Um, there's a question of how long will data be stored on the network? Um, and like I said, this is a decision on the data publisher. So the data publisher can say, okay, I want to host this for a year. So that means they need to designate an amount of tokens that will last a year. And then this, uh, after this year is passed, the, the, the tokens will be spent. That means the, the, the network uh, nodes will no longer be incentivized to host the data. They will not get just have any rewards to, to take with. But that doesn't automatically mean that, um, that uh, they might not want to keep it. Because if you remember from the beginning, we believe that data is inherently valuable. So therefore, they might decide they want to, or let's say, optimistically keep it. Um, will it be possible to repost or republish jobs and, uh, data to the network that you may no longer? Yes. So in this V6, the answer is, short answer is yes. You're able to republish by basically assigning more tokens to the same asset because we're no longer talking about jobs. We're talking about publishing assets. And that's going to be one of the biggest changes, actually. Uh, it's, it's, it's even a lingo change, uh, which, which is really important. We'll explain more about it uh, uh, in detail, obviously. But essentially, think of it as if you have some data persisting on the network and you want to make sure that it stays longer than you initially anticipated, you'll just be able to essentially add more tokens to that same, uh, same piece of data or same asset. And um, okay, questions are coming in like, like a lot. So we, um, I suggest we keep going with the questions and um, because they're not directly related to what Nicolas showed us, we continue with the program uh, and then we, we finalize the questions at the end. So uh, uh, don't worry guys, we'll address them, but uh, let's, uh, let's stop here and jump into, into the next part of the presentation, which is, uh, where we want to show you a little bit more. Maybe we answer some more questions, some questions through this directly. This is really the decentralized knowledge graph in action to the FSM project and data marketplace. And there's only a couple of slides. There's a lot more uh, information to uncover, but I'll try to explain uh, very briefly what the FSM is and then how, it, how origin trail is used. Um, so the FSM is actually uh, the food safety market. It's an SME powered industrial data platform. So actually all of these companies you see on the screen, they're all partners in the project. And the idea is to boost competitiveness of European food certification. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, it, it really helps uh, just to point in your head that this is about um, really European standards in, in, in terms of certification. The mission is to create a transparent data-powered certification ecosystem for a safe food supply chain. That's the official mission of the project. And all of these companies on the, on the list are, uh, or institutions are actually part of it. 
including universities, companies such as Ontotext, uh, all of these are our partners. Um, and as you can see, Trace Labs as well as core developers of Origin Trail. Um, so what is interesting here for us is to talk about this knowledge marketplace within the FSM. And essentially, this project combines a lot of technical components. There's semantic services, uh, quite a lot of cooperation there with the team from Ontotext who are building, by the way, GraphDB and, and other semantic services, blockchains, as we mentioned, access control mechanisms uh, on a very advanced level. Ubitech is one of the lead partners there. Several existing platforms like Fudakai Agree, uh, others. But the common thread here is that they share a common data pool. So uh, all of these organizations that are using these platforms, um, that's food certification bodies, uh, European uh, institutions in general, but also farmers, food companies, food producers, they all share common data pool. And the implementation of Origin Trail is really here to index these FSM data sets for discoverability and mutability. Somebody should mute themselves. I don't know who that is, but you know who you are. You're making a little bit of noise. Um, so yes, um, that's it. That, was a, that was a bad joke, not mutability, actually immutability. <laughs> so the, the indexing of data sets for discoverability and, and verifiability and placing them on a marketplace, on, on the data marketplace. The idea there is that you can go to a data marketplace, you can discover some interesting data sets, and then you can utilize a trusted purchasing mechanism based on origin trail to actually um, utilize that. If you remember that, that sequence diagram I showed, those data exchange protocols at the bottom, that's what we're talking about here. So we're gonna go now into how that works. And uh, before we just go into that, I just want to point out that we're speaking about this. This is one of the knowledge marketplace, one of the knowledge incentivization tools that are being built uh, to, to um, uh, complement Origin Trail version 6. So they are the tool stack, uh, not just them, but they are one of the main components of the tool stack that are going to be uh, part uh, and built on top of V6. Uh, these are knowledge tokens, knowledge wallets, marketplaces, and tenders. And the idea there is that you're able to tokenize your knowledge or assets um, create assets really out of the knowledge with fungible and non-fungible tokens, create sort of a, a, a knowledge management wallet with marketplaces and tenders where you can actually monetize it. And uh, we, we spoke about this before, a while ago. Um, some of you might know about them. I just wanted to, to refer to this. Uh, we're now going to go deep into the marketplace side of things and how that works or how, how one of those marketplaces to, works. Couple of things we need to briefly touch upon. What this is built on is standards. So uh, we're not inventing things from scratch. This is one of the core principles of Origin Trail, which is focusing on really interoperability. And there's two core things that we're using here. One is verifiable credentials. Now I wanna show this graphic very briefly for a minute, just so we can understand later what's going on. Uh, essentially, the verifiable credentials is a W3C standard. We can look it up in the link at the bottom that proposes four components. There's somebody who's an issuer, in this case of a credential, but uh, in the more general sense of the origin trail decentralized knowledge graph, it's an assertion. Somebody issues some data, right? Then there's somebody holding the data. That would be the network itself, actually, or a particular uh, sub graph in the network, a private graph. And then we have somebody who's a verifier in this uh, verifiable credentials model, somebody who actually receives a presentation of this data. That, that, that means it doesn't have to be the complete data. It can also be a transformation of the data. And this verifier utilizes the verifiable data registry to verify that what they got is actually issued by the issuer and that it actually has been uh, issued in this particular form. This, in terms of verifiable credentials, is intended for things that are credentials. So mostly like passports, digital, versions of uh, ID cards, things like that, where you as a holder are able to hold this within your own, let's say phone, and nobody else has your own digital passport. And then you can show it to somebody else and then they can go and verify the integrity of what you show them, this data, using some verifiable data registry, which is usually a DL DLT. Um, so Origin Trail actually implements this and we use this, uh, this model in the, the, the data marketplace, the, the knowledge marketplace uh, systems where actually the publisher, the seller of the data sets 
uh, puts a certain amount of data, which is this proofs and in, uh, index, indexing material on the origin trail decentralized network so that somebody who later becomes a verifier, actually a buyer of this data set is able to purchase that from, from the issuer who is also the holder in this case. So the issuer and the holder are the same person and then uh, query that from the decentralized knowledge graph and verify. Another component that is used is DIDs, decentralized identifiers. That means having the ability to identify something in a decentralized context, either on a decentralized network, like for example, you want to identify an NFT on a blockchain or you want to identify some object in the real world. It doesn't matter. You can attach DIDs um, to them. And actually DIDs are core standard on top of what UALs are built, universal asset locators that we will be speaking more in the future. The point here with this, these DIDs is that, um, and I encourage you to look at the standard, the link is at the bottom, is that actually enables um, assigning um, identities to, to particular, uh, um, let's say, uh, networks. So when we talk about the FSM, where we utilize origin trail there is actually to index these FSM data sets, to discover them and to monetize them. And we implement this fair swap protocol, which was actually uh, as is, is the first implementation of a knowledge marketplace designed by University of Warsaw and Darmstadt uh, scientists. You can see uh, actually the paper that they wrote here. And it looks uh, like this actually. So we have a seller and, and this sequence diagram might be a little complicated. So I'll try to drive it through it. We have a seller, uh, a, a data seller, a knowledge seller that actually puts a data set on sale to this FSM interface. The FSM interface actually is used to forward that, to index this data into the decentralized knowledge graph. And then some buyer actually at some point discovers this data set either through directly to the DKG. So it doesn't have to be a user of the FSM. They can actually find it even outside of the FSM, which is a characteristic of obviously Web3. We want a permissionless open system. So either through that, or there might be users of the FSM platform. So you can actually, they can discover this data set or these assets in the FSM platform, uh, which in the end also performs a search on the DKG. Once this discovery is done, that was the first part of the protocol, then the buyer actually utilizes the, the knowledge marketplace. And in this way, they actually initiate the purchase by locking tokens in a smart contract uh, or origin to a smart contract um, for the seller uh, saying, okay, I want to buy this. I want to buy this thing with this identifier, with this UAL. Then the seller actually, after seeing this operation happen, sends an encrypted data set to the buyer uh, with um, an, actually an encryption key later when the verification of this transaction has happened. So this uh, key can be used to unlock the data set, to decrypt the data set that the buyer received. The buyer then verifies, now this is obviously a lot of steps that we didn't put on here to, for complexity reasons. The buyer then verifies this data set. The buyer can verify its integrity using the, the, the principles that we described for origin trail. And if it manages to verify the, the integrity, if it actually received the proper data that has been indexed in the graph, um, then, um, then, then they're, they're done. The buyer has got the data set that they paid for, and the seller is then able to withdraw tokens if no misbehavior by the seller has been detected. If however, there's misbehavior, that means the seller can just throw some crap data at the buyer because the buyer doesn't know from the beginning uh, as it's encrypted, right? So the seller can send some, some crap. Uh, when the buyer actually decrypts it or is not able to decrypt it, um, is, he's actually able co to construct something called proof of misbehavior. And this is what these clever uh, people from universities of, of Darmstadt and, and Warsaw has, have invented, uh, which basically allows this knowledge marketplace to discern if the seller has been cheating or not. And if so, the buyer is able to uh, get their tokens back. So it's a verifiable transaction of data for tokens. And there's basically no way that the seller can trick the buyer into sending him some 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 bad data and getting the tokens. The buyer is able to be sure that they will really get the data that they uh, that was previously indexed and what they were searching for. So this is, I know it's a little bit of a mouthful, 
but uh, obviously we'll, we'll share more on it. And if you're interested, FairSwap protocol has been very detailed, uh, explained in, in detail in this paper uh, on how this proof of misbehavior works. Um, again, this is just one type of knowledge marketplace implementation. There will more likely be more, uh, but it's it's the one that has been implemented in the FSM project is being under uh, used uh, used as we speak um, in um, uh, still in development though. So this is not not uh, not yet on um, uh, in the production environment. Um, all right, so, so that's a very brief overview of how knowledge marketplaces uh, are built on the DKG. It's been V6, These will, this will come as a common tool in the tool stack. We can find out more information on these couple of links, the Food Safety Market website, including Trace Labs and Origin Trail IO websites. Um, hope that was useful to illustrate a little bit better how it's, it's being used today. Um, all right, and then I... Um, We'll proceed to one more topic before Q&A, very short one, but very cool one. Origin Trail Bounty Program for V6 has been launched actually yesterday. There is a pool of 250,000 trace tokens for contributors in the bounty program. There's two ways you can contribute. And one is uh, open right now, that is contributing to code, uh, to GitHub. That means contributing by helping us uh, bring this V6 quicker to, to uh, the actual uh, uh, final stages of the launch, meaning writing code, uh, solving issues, providing uh, information on bugs, helping on documentation. There's actually quite a few ways you can contribute to GitHub and uh, all of them explained at this link, bountyprogram.origintrella.io. Apart from this type of contribution, very soon, we will also open up something called telemetry contributions. So if you're not a developer and you're not able to contribute to, to GitHub, uh, you'll still be able to be part of the bounty program. And that will be possible by running origin trail nodes. So in the V6 testnet, what we're trying to do is actually we're collectively trying to break the testnet. <laughs> we're trying to, to collect as much telemetry information as possible. And you might have seen while Nicola was showing the logs that actually in the logs of the node, or if you're running a node, you'll see that the node is actually measuring how long it takes the node to perform every operation. So how long does it take to do a publish? How long does it take to respond to a query on the network and so on. And all of this actually is being aggregated and stored locally by something called the telemetry plugin. This plugin is actually then submitting all this data is, is about to start submitting all this data to the DKG itself and a, a telemetry hub, another interface that we have created is going to be open where you can see actually how all of these measurements combine. And um, to incentivize more people to join the program, we actually uh, created this whole telemetry system so that everybody running a node is able to submit, their node will automatically be able to submit this data. Now, how will this competition happen? Well, basically um, we will create a scoreboard and this scoreboard will um, show the contributors according to their contribution, right? And the contribution now probably thinking like, what is, how is this ranking going to happen? Well, we're going to, uh, assess data quantity and data quality. So let's say the longer your node is running, if your node is running 50 days and my node is running two days, well, obviously you contributed more data to us as developers, which helped more towards launching V6. That's valued more, therefore you will be higher in the ranking list. But it's not just about quantity of data, it's also about quality. So if you're you know, just running your node and not doing anything with it, it's not as high quality data as if you were, let's say, uh, testing the node in terms of doing search queries or publishing things on the network. And then by using the node, there's a higher chance that you know, you'll run into some bug or something rather than just having a dormant node, which is also valuable. If your node doesn't do anything, of course, that's, I mean, it does something for the network. It's gonna produce telemetry data, but it's, 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 um, it's valuable to do some more things with it. So try to be creative with it. Um, in the end, this ranking, with, at the end of the bounty program will, will uh, basically determine the amount of reward for every participant. And uh, there's gonna be a curve function so that basically the idea is that we don't reward, let's say the top five contributors that everybody was, is gonna get some reward. 
Uh, it's just a matter of you know how much you've been engaging with with uh, with your notes. So again, to remind you, bounty program two ways to contribute. One is GitHub. You can contribute code, uh, all kinds of things. You can build new things. Um, obviously, with some constraints and some some rules, um, which you can all find on this website. Or if you're not a coder, you can run a node um, as soon as this uh, this starts, which is early February, and you can contribute telemetry data, and you will earn uh, some rewards. Now, depending on how creative you get, how how much you um, you use the the graph the the, the DKG through your node, uh, that's also going to depend on your score. But um, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys in, in the program and it's going to give us a lot of help. This is like the best possible test we can get. And like I said, we are going to try and break it because if we can break it, then that means uh, that means we're, we found some issue before actually going to main it, which is the point of, of, this, of this launch process. Um, all right, so I'll stop here. This is very short about the bounty program. We are uh, we crossed over the designated time for two minutes. Um, it's not to say we cannot stay for a bit longer. So um, it's QA time. The suggestion is uh, I, I need to run in fifteen, but uh, perhaps uh, we can uh, we can maybe have a few more people stay if it makes sense. Um, the QA is by the way it doesn't have to be just through chat. So you can um, also post your question or give your comment or provide an idea it doesn't it's it's not necessarily just question and answer so this is this is a uh, this slide is not really perfectly illustrating this is an open discussion uh, so um, anybody who wants to to um, raise their hand and say something this is a, a good place to do it um, usually I ask Amos to pitch in I don't know if he's around um, if you want to say something or, or anybody from the community um, but yeah um, the floor is yours guys. <laughs> There's a lot of questions in the chat, but not a lot of courage to speak out loud, huh? <laughs> oh, I'm happy to speak out loud. Oh, whoa, let's go then. Hello, hi, uh, Roman. I, I've been following the, the Trace project since earlier this year. Um, and as a result, been holding a few tokens and running nodes. Uh, and part of a collaborative groups of people that have been interested in the project. And we are at the moment questioning the, the, um, the utility, uh, the, the point of running a node with the current v, v5. Um, it's, as you probably know, not profitable. It's actually costing money every month, just a few euros given and blocking token on a very expensive blockchain. Um, is there any motivational quotes you wanna um, give people <laughs> for V6? Anything that would mean, yes, there is a point of running a node on V6. And I'm talking about mainnet, not the, not the bounty program. Yeah, okay, all right, that's a good question. Well, um, two points to it. Uh, one, one point is, uh, yeah, absolutely, we expect that uh, nodes on the V6 uh, are not only going to have a lot of performance improvement; they're going to actually be able to host a lot more, uh, a lot more um, uh, information on, on assets that we just discussed about. Uh, in terms of the other topics uh, on profitability, that's kind of always hard to to speak on because it depends on the the uh, size of the network. Just like in blockchain, if you have uh, a lot of miners, right, and the hash rate grows, <clears throat> then um, it's it 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 becomes diff, uh, kind of a, a, a profitability, um, let's say, um, uh, damper for for this particular chain. So that's when, for example, the token uh, like Bitcoin goes down. You see nodes uh, well being turned off because the, the 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 way it works. It's very similar in the DKG. So we have uh, basically an open market. Anybody can run a node, and the more the node, the more nodes in the network. Uh, well, obviously, the the more um, mouths to feed, and in that sense, it's it's also um, now a, a thing of you know being making a decision if that is uh, something you want to do uh, or not, and that that also depends on obviously the the way you manage your your uh, infrastructure, which is part of the responsibility of running a node, but also what for what use case you're using it. Is it just to run a node, or is it to use it for a 
for a particular uh, implementation. So it's it's kind of a hard question, but if if you're looking for a motivational quote, which I think is is not a bad idea, uh, well, um, all all I can say is I can refer revert back to network effects and uh, back to last year when you might have seen um, a large uh, or pretty much hockey stick graph growth uh, when multi-chain Origin 12 version 5 was launched. Well, we expect to see a similar thing happening in version 6, uh, where we actually, uh, compared to the last time uh, of launching version 5, we have a huge performance increase and huge flex, uh, not flexibility, but usability uh, boost with introducing Sparkle and all of these things that we've shown today. So uh, bottom line being, um, it's again, it's your decision. But uh, I'm very bullish and, and uh, very excited to see how we get this uh, version six running because it's going to be really, really, uh, really many, many, many times better than version five in many ways, including creating these network effects on the on the value of the data. So, um, all right, that's that's a, a hopefully answers your question to to some extent. Hi, Thank hello. you, and I yeah, thanks. Thanks, yeah, just, thanks, Branimir, and uh, thank you, Roman, for a question. This is Shiga. I just wanted to add to Branimir's point uh, that V6 is opening uh, ways uh, for Origin 12 to become ubiquitous in a quickly expanding niche of, of Web3. And currently, Web3 is mostly um, associated with uh, DeFi projects and not a lot of mainstream activities happening in the Web3. And Origin 12 essentially is a is a gateway for mainstream uh, actors to start engaging in in Web3 sector. And it is also Trace Labs and other builders also introducing ways to interact with Origin Trail that have previously not been available. One of such mechanisms is called the UAL. Uh, Branimir has described what that is. Uh, and analogous to URL in the Web2 world, uh, which is like a very ubiquitous way of using uh, Web2, UAL uh, is also going to make a way for uh, Web3 to be uh, engaged with and Origin Trail to be used ubiquitously by so many mainstream actors. So perhaps if we are seeking a, a pitch, <laughs> like a, a motivational quote uh, about Origin Trail, this is also one of, of the compelling reasons why it makes sense to be part of Origin Trail ecosystem, not only as a, as a node runner, but also as someone who is participating to the, to the, to the GitHub, someone who's using Origin Trail as a solution to essentially make assets discoverable and discoverability of different kinds of assets from physical to digital essentially is going to, to drive tremendous value for a um, multitude of, of stakeholders. So the future ahead is very bright. And uh, I guess the main point about Origin Trail has always been that we're delivering uh, permissionless solutions or so neutral solution, solutions that are not barring anyone from, from using it, uh, uh, including being uh, node runners, course it's a permissionless system and on the other on the other side usability a very important um, value of, of ours so that the systems that are being um, developed are actually useful that's my two cents thanks well thank you both for your answers uh, good to speak to you directly thanks thank you and thank you for joining the call and posting questions uh, i've been using the time to post some chats, uh, chat answers very briefly. Um, and uh, since we're, we're very close to, I mean, we're 10 minutes over, let me try and quickly run through some of the questions uh, that, were, that were in the chat. Like for example, a, a quick one I noticed, why the switch from Orango uh, by Calvin? Good question. Uh, actually, Orango uh, natively does not support RDF. So, uh, but if you refer, if you uh, were part there for the, that part of the presentation, the idea is not to switch, the idea is to extend so that you're able to pick different, um, really different data stores, different graph stores. And um, natively, Arango doesn't support uh, Sparkle. So for, for this additional Sparkle support, this is where we, uh, in this case, we showed GraphDB. It's also not the idea to fix on GraphDB. So uh, the idea is to, you know, use a generalized triple store and then you can um, as a user like i said decide okay maybe you want to use 
Um, you don't want to use GraphDB because for some reason you don't like it. You want to use Blaze Graph because Wikidata is using it, for example. So that is um, in the short, very short answer. Um, also, I've seen a question um, on uh, the Explorer, which I quickly answered um, in, in the chat. And um, it was another one regarding closest. That was the, the one that was very interesting, the closest node neighbors. Um, and is it based on network latency? A very good question, Dustin. I Oh, hey, Dustin. Um, Dustin is an old community member. Uh, I hope that's that's the Dustin I'm speaking about. <laughs> so very briefly, the, the network latency plays a role, but actually the discovery is not uh, based on closeness in terms of network latency. In the Kademlia protocol, it's based on XOR distance. So that means that actually there's a, a, a whole address space that is being shared by all nodes. And all in this address space is what we actually leverage for the indexing protocol. So the nodes that are, um, um, they, they know how to manage this Kademlia uh, address space in some notion called buckets. I encourage you to look into it. Um, but essentially, whenever they're looking for something on the network, they're trying to find the, the XOR distance between the indexed uh, keyword and that particular uh, particular um, thing that you're searching for. And if this, this XOR metric, which is actually a commutative, uh, commutative um, metric, uh, basically is like a subtraction, um, when, you, when you do that, you actually get, uh, you're able to use that as a, a network, uh, let's say distance metric. So this is what is used in, in the system. Um, um, there was there were, there were some longer questions. Um, there was a question on Python client I got in a private message. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good question. So you've seen a JavaScript client, the Python client is on the way and you will be able, able to contribute it. A Rust client is also on the way. So we will have clients pretty much in all of these major languages that, um, uh, well, uh, people in the blockchain, Web3, and, and knowledge graph space use. So um, this will be um, making it easier for you to, to use it uh, on, in your own projects. Um, kind of scrolling here through the questions. Um, will there be a recording? Yes, there will be a recording um, of, of this afterwards. Uh, okay, there's a question, a very good one, um, for which I'll try to give a very short answer uh, by Dean uh, regarding um, with the move to assets, um, are from what I understood about how data is persisted, does this mean the incentivization reward is changing with V6? Uh, actually, it, it, it does. It's changing for the better. So in very brief terms, and this is the next stage of Origin 12 launch, uh, version 6 launch, um, so we're in stage one right now where we're testing the network and data layer. And uh, by the way, it's very going very well. We've discovered quite a few bugs that we have resolved or on, on the way to resolve uh, right away before we actually introduce the incentivization layer. Uh, this incentivization layer introduction is coming quite soon. And the difference, the key difference here with the, the rewards is that we're introducing a different system which will uh, resolve litigation. So before we had a litigation system, which would actually um, create a, a, a disincentive for removing data from the nodes or for not responding. Um, and in that case, actually being able to uh, take a part of the reward back from the, from the node that was supposed to take it. Well, here the, the difference is uh, that they we're going the opposite way. So instead of doing this slashing or punishing method, it's actually gonna be a rewarding method. So all of the nodes hosting a certain data for a certain asset are gonna be able to qualify for rewards. And very similar to the way we're doing this for the bounty campaign, there's gonna be basically kind of a ranking. The nodes that are the most, um, uh, let's say the most, elig the most eligible or the, the best ones uh, by the incentivization protocol to host a certain uh, set of data 
are going to be able to, to claim a piece of the rewards uh, in certain periods. Now, like I said, it's really hard to give a short answer. We're going to post a, a much more detailed set of information on this as soon as uh, stage two is, uh, um, is, is here. Um, but basically, the idea here is that nodes will be able to claim rewards and part of this um, eligibility or um, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, appropriateness and, uh, and um, um, the, the nodes that should be incentivized is actually based on their location in the network. So we want the right data in the right place so we can query for it, but also on um, several other parameters on the node including price, including, um, including the nodes uh, commitment and pre previous commitment in the network. So in a way of providing a, a ranking that um, makes sense from the perspective of the value uh, that the nodes are providing to the network. Um, again, this is gonna be much longer and better explanation. Um, uh, Calvin has an audio question. Uh, you, sir, are very welcome to post it. <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, hello. Awesome. So just a, a sort of a, a fun question. Um, the first thing is uh, I want to give huge uh, credit to OT as a whole for the support um, with V6. Like you guys said you're going to do a thing and you did. Uh, NZT, you are awesome. Like your responsiveness and uh, um, feel like you're in the trench with us. Like you, you're you're one of us. You're you're knocking out stuff that uh, some of the people are are bringing up and stuff. So that's just so impressive. Um, the uh, my sort of fun question is regarding the uh, jobs that we um, kicked out right after the intro. Um, I wrote a, a sort of a noob installer to make it as easy for people to do, and I wanted to give credit to Cosmic and Max who worked out the publish uh, GitHub projects that everybody ran initially. I think probably for fun, our initial thing was just spam. So we basically, being straight, beat the shit out of the node with um, cron jobs that sent a new job every four seconds, whether it was ready for it or not. And when the uh, MySQL database got uh, bogged down, we just wiped it and started over. So uh, with that in mind, what did you guys think of, you know, what was your expectation? Um, I think it was a, over a weekend that uh, we, you know, oh, and last thing real quick is uh, all the people in the Node channel that helped all the people get set up. Um, this was an effort by a pretty large group of people, um, the people that created the things, and then Sam in the Node channel who walked a ton of people through getting everything set up. What did you guys think of the numbers? Um, obviously, we went uh, crazy trying to see how many transactions we can get. And I think at one point we were, uh, you know, a substantial majority of the jobs on the test net. <laughs> That's a very good summary and uh, absolutely plus one on all of the shout outs for me. Um, it's, it's a very interesting uh, thing to see the network being slammed so hard by you guys. Um, <laughs> keep doing it, keep doing it, it's gonna be good. Uh, we've actually, I mean, we, we detected uh, already some some issues because of that. Like you said, my 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 SQL stopped working. The node didn't, right? The node survived, but my SQL didn't. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> we also have, uh, yeah, I mean, GraphDB from time to time tends to to pop out. Um, working on fixes or, or um, really um, uh, approaches on how to handle this in the best way, uh, as we speak, actually. And probably Nico, I can say a little bit more about that, but there's a bunch of things that we discovered because you guys were really, really awesome in testing it so far. And I'm super excited that uh, now we're gonna get this bounty going that uh, it's gonna you know, incentivize even more people and you, of course, to, to do even more uh, good work for the network by slamming it. <laughs> Real quick, just to be clear. So there is still, oh, Amos here, by the way. <laughs> So there is still value in spam, even if the data sets is not unique, moving into the future, there's still going to be value in the amount of transactions your node puts out, even if the data is not unique because, you know, throughput and whatnot. So you're, you're saying that's still valuable as it relates to the bounty. 
Uh, okay, very good question. So the, the, to go back to the bounty point, we are uh, in this point going to focus on telemetry. So that means basically all of your nodes will be sending this, the same data in terms of the same, the, the measurements. Uh, that's the, the core of it. So um, even if you're publishing the same data set on the network, um, it's still measuring publishing time, right? And things like that. Uh, however, uh, the, the performance or, or the, the, the quality of the data will probably be better if you're not publishing the same thing all over again. Uh, it will communicate with different nodes. It will do different things. And, and then because we are able to measure the sort of the variance of the data in terms of uh, what as one parameter of the quality, it's, um, it will be more, let's say, um, it, it, it's better to go and uh, sort of spread it out a bit and not create one single data set and publish it uh, many times. I see. Hey, okay. real, Thank you. Real quick, Brenna, on uh, that topic. So the question that I would have is we were running the node, of course, and then we were running cron jobs mindlessly in a loop uh, like every four or six seconds. And whether the node could keep up with it or not, it was having jobs issued. Is, is there a recommended amount of sort of publishing that can occur or that you want to see concurrently? Um, we're sort of switching in the node channel uh, from spam data to useful data. So we have uh, like we're publishing weather data. Uh, Sam wrote a blockbuster uh, that's publishing um, movie data. Um, but in terms of like the testing we're recommending to people to do, I'm, my instinct says you're not going to want jobs issued mindlessly every four or six seconds, whether the node's keeping up. Do you have any guidelines you want to give us in terms of like you just want one thread at a time of publishing and then what we are doing currently is that and then we're just looping it like a, a while true or a while do loop. So as soon as the publish gets done, we're immediately starting the next one, just one at a time uh, or, or any guidelines that way. Yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, th there's two components to the answer. So one is um, introducing, so this, this first stress test was very valuable because we, you know, we got to the point of some things breaking, like I said, MySQL and so on. And this was, uh, this was great to see because then we would see, you know, what we can improve, how to handle this. Uh, but one of the things that um, we should not forget is that actually this, uh, we're kind of spamming here, right? This is not something that uh, is and should happen on the mainnet. So the, the test right now is not really that relevant um, in regards to the relevant env environment that we want to look at, which is the, the mainnet. And why is it not relevant? Well, because in every decentralized system like a blockchain, a transaction costs something, right? So you cannot like spam Ethereum because you don't have enough Ether problem. <laughs> and even if you want to, like, you know, there's a certain amount of stuff you can fit into a block. Um, and a similar way in on the, the, the DKG, there's not uh, an infinite amount of uh, trace tokens that somebody can have and just like, you know, slam the network nonstop. So um, that is actually the reason why introducing the token uh, before the telemetry uh, bounty starts is where we want to really test something in the real environment. Right now, it's, it's, it is stage one. We're able to test the API. We're able to test publishing. We're able to test the network in some stage, but the stage is not, um, is not ready to you know, um, perform one of the key functions, which is spam protection. And spam protection is really, you know, it just won't um, it won't go without uh, additional tokens. And so, so in that that's part of the answer. Like I said, you you probably won't be able to do a cron job every four seconds because you run out of the test tokens. Um, the other the 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 second point uh, which uh, I wanted to also make is that um, uh, remember this this is a stage process is evolutionary, so. Um, there might, we expect uh, certain things to happen. For example, uh, imagine that we manage to, let's say all of us, we just overload the network somehow, even with all, all anti-spam mechanisms. Uh, it would make sense that we coordinate in a way that uh, 
through Discord, for example, we say, okay, guys, lay back for, for a day or two so we can fix something and we, we deploy it. You know, maybe we will need this. So this is where we will need some cooperation back and forth. Obviously, through GitHub and Discord, uh, everybody should kind of, that following should be aware of what's going on. Uh, so we expect that potentially we would need to do something like that. Um, so how does that uh, refer to, to the bounty? Well, basically, we'll see if we have a period like that, uh, perhaps that period is not going to be uh, in, um, in the bounty, um, um, calculated in the bounty score. Uh, but we're going through basically an evolutionary thing here. So expect uh, that we might want to uh, perform activities on the testnet as we go that um, uh, you should be informed of. So this part of this bounty, and, and, and it's not just like you turn on an old and you, you know, turn on some Chrome job and you go away for three months. Um, the, the point is actually also to be uh, engaged, so to follow what's going on, to know what's what are the current, the, what is the current state of the network and development? And I know a lot of you already do that. So my, my point here being is that uh, first one, we have spam protection. We're gonna get into this relevant state where we really test uh, properly. And then second one is even when we test, we don't know, we might run into something where we would need to uh, sort of uh, lay off of the publish button <laughs> for a day or two. And this we will signal through Discord uh, to you guys. Did, did I answer your question? Does that make sense? Yeah, you sure did. Uh, I asked in the chat, do you guys uh, intend to pro uh, provide any kind of like uh, official publish script or do you want the community to continue to develop? Or basically we got a, a script that's sort of testing that's rotating between like six different free APIs we found so that the data is you know, different. Do you have? Do you guys think you're going to provide something that that's unified for everybody to run, or do you want a uh, variety? Well, essentially, in terms of scripts, uh, there hasn't been a lot of, um, let's say, initiative there from our side. Where we're looking more into creating clients, so SDKs, really SDKs for Python, SDKs for for different type of languages that you can then publish through. So you can create a. You can basically take the DKG client right now in JavaScript. You can create a, a loop, a very long loop, and you can publish from some API for, for a lot of time. Or you can create a very simple publish JavaScript uh, piece of code that you can then run through a cron. Um, basically, we didn't intend on providing the additional type of scripts um, that, than this. However, I think the script you guys made, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. I mean, it, it does the job, right? Obviously it managed to slam uh, MySQL, which is success. <laughs> All right, we are one hour and 30 minutes in. Um, I really need to go because I'm already late for, for a meeting. Um, but uh, I also propose we close this call because before everybody gets super tired. Thanks everybody for, for coming, this was, awesome to see everybody here and to engage like this. Um, please shoot us any feedback or any remaining questions we didn't get to answer. You can shoot them directly in Discord or, um, or even like um, uh, GitHub if you believe so. And we'd really like to, to use that to improve the next meeting. Tell us uh, if uh, there was something you'd like more to see more of, something less of, do we speak too much, do we, you know, think of th those things uh, and uh, please send them to us. We would love to, to improve and uh, we'd love to see you all on the next call. So uh, thanks everybody. And um, yeah, I'm gonna wave to and drop off for my meeting then laid off. Uh, and um, yeah, all the recordings are gonna be published by the way, that's one more one more piece of info that, uh, that I think I missed to, to say. So that's why we were using Zoom. Have a good one, Brenna. Bye, everyone. You too. Bye, everyone. Cheers.